In this demonstration, we're going to create an external content type from a SQL Server database. I have SQL Server Management Studio open, and if we expand the database folder, go down a little, we'll see a database in here called MiniCRM. MiniCRM is a very simple database. It has a table in it called Names, and if we go ahead and open that table up, you'll see that this table is just a table that has basic contact information in it like first name, last name, email, and phone. So this is really just a very simple contact type list. But our idea here is to make an external content type that works against this table so we can understand the basics of how it's done. In order to get started, we'll go into the SharePoint Designer. And here in the SharePoint Designer, to create a new external content type, you'll start by clicking on the External Content Types node. External content types are all farm level when they're created here in SharePoint Designer like this. So it doesn't matter so much which site you go to. You're really going to see all of the available external content types. So we're currently working in a development site uh, but again, you could go anywhere and see these. In order to start, we'll come up to the ribbon and we'll say that we'd like to create a new external content type. When I create a new external content type, I need to provide a name for that external content type. So we'll go ahead and we'll just call this contact. We can also provide a display name. For us, we'll keep it simple, and we'll just have the display name also be contact. We can provide a namespace for our external content type. Now, the namespace, as you see here, sort of defaults to the value of the, uh, of the site that you're on. And also, sometimes people are confused by the fact that the namespace has this URI format. But the truth is, this just needs to be a unique string, so it really doesn't matter what the namespace is as long as it's unique. So we can come in and change it to a single word like that if we want. And just as long as no one else is using that namespace and that exact name, um, we won't have any collisions with our external content type. We have a version here. You can see it's version 1. And then the last thing that we need to do is pick the office item type. The idea behind the office item type is that you can pick the kind of list that this will most, rep most be like represented inside of a rich office client. So if you think about synchronizing this data to Microsoft Outlook, for example, the type of information contained in this table is really most like a contact. So we can go ahead and click contact, and that will have an impact on the behavior that appears when we synchronize with rich external clients. Now we have sort of the header information or title information complete for our external content type. Now what we can do is go ahead and define the connection to the external system we want to communicate with as well as the basic CRUD operations. We do that by coming up to the ribbon and clicking on Operations Design View. When we click on Operations Design View, what we're going to see is a screen that shows us all the different connections to external systems that are available to us. If we don't see the one we want, then we can simply click Add Connection. And when we do that, the first dialog we see is one that asks us which connector we want to use. So you can see that we have available here the SQL connector, which allows us to talk to SQL Server databases, the WCF service connector, which allows us to talk to web services, and the .NET type, which is our custom connector. Notably absent from this list of connectors is the OData connector, and that's because the SharePoint designer does not support the OData, uh, the OData connector. So unfortunately, we cannot connect directly to RESTful endpoints from the SharePoint designer. The OData connection is only supported through Visual Studio. So if you want to use RESTful endpoints, then Visual Studio is the tool where that happens. 
In our case, what we're going to do is talk to that database, so we'll select the SQL Server connection and then click OK. After I select that connector, then I'm presented with a pretty standard connection dialog box that asks me the key information necessary to connect to the database. So it wants to know what server we're using. For us, that's Wingtip Server. The database name that we're going to connect to, it's Mini CRM. And then we can also provide a, uh, a name here. This is optional, but we can provide sort of an, a, a display name if we want to show this connection in the list. And so for us, let's just go ahead and call this contacts data like that. Now lastly, we have to decide how we're going to connect to the database. So we can connect with the user's identity, which means that when someone is viewing our solution inside of SharePoint, like the external list, then the underlying infrastructure will attempt to use the identity of the user who is currently viewing the list in order to connect to the database. We can also connect with an impersonated Windows identity or an impersonated custom identity. Now when you select either one of these options, impersonated Windows identity or impersonated custom identity, you'll notice that the Secure Store Application ID box lights up. And the reason for that is that these last two options rely on the Secure Store and they'll be needing to do credential mapping from the current user to a set of credentials that's appropriate for use with the database. Now, mostly the reason that we need to be worried about the credential mapping for such a simple solution is that credentials will not necessarily transfer from the current user all the way through to the database. So if we choose to connect with the user's identity, what happens in SharePoint is that SharePoint as an ASP.NET application is set up to impersonate the person who is actually looking at the page. And so that works really well when you get started in that if someone is looking at the external list, SharePoint will try to impersonate their credentials. However, when SharePoint turns around to try then to talk to the SQL database where the mini CRM table is located, then what happens is the credentials will not transfer from SharePoint to the database. And this is generally referred to as the double hop problem. It's not really a bug, it's really a security feature of Windows authentication in NTLM mode. This problem goes away if you're configured for Kerberos, but most organizations still use NTLM, which means that connecting with the user's identity is not going to be a viable solution. Now for our demonstration here, we can go ahead and connect with the user's identity just to get started to look at the process of building external content types. So we'll go ahead and click OK. After we click OK, you can see now we have a new contacts data source. And if I expand it, you'll notice that we can access tables, views, and stored procedures called routines here in this folder. And the external content type CRUD operations that we are going to perform against the system now can be based on either direct access to a table, the use of a view, or stored procedures. We can come in here and expand one, so we'll expand tables to keep it simple. And then here's the names table that we want to talk to. So I'm going to go ahead and right click the names table, and you can see that I'm offered a set of operations that I can create. Basically, these are your CRUD operations. Now, when you base your operations on a table, SharePoint Designer can infer a lot about the way that the CRUD operation should be constructed because tables have nice things like primary keys. So it makes it easy for it to create the various CRUD operations. And so we're offered an option that says create all the operations for us. And that's the simple way to go. So we're going to go ahead and click on create all operations. Now, when you create all the operations, even though the SharePoint designer can infer an awful lot about the structure of the table and what the CRUD operation should look like, it can't really do everything. 
So it surfaces this wizard to you for you to be able to finish off with some information that the SharePoint designer needs to complete the definition of the external content type. So we'll start with the wizard here and click Next. And the first thing that we see is the parameters configuration. Now, this wizard can be a little confusing to you at first. And so the thing to do is to focus on the errors and warnings that are down here in the bottom. And if we look, you can see the first error here says the following office properties need to be mapped to data source elements with compatible data types, last name, full name, uh, as string. What this error message is telling us is that earlier we specified that our external content type behaved like a contact as far as Outlook was concerned. And the wizard is telling us, well, if you want this to behave like an Outlook in con uh, like a contact in the Outlook uh, system, then you need to tell me what fields in your external content type map to the last name or full name that will be used by Outlook. And so if you look over here on the left, you'll see the fields that are coming from our database table. And over here on the right, you can see an office property picker. So we're told by the message that we have to specify last name or full name. So let's go ahead and start with last name. We'll click on that. Come over to the office property picker, drop it down. And then what we can do is find last name. and map it and notice the error goes away. Now as long as we're in here working on last name we can do a couple of other things that are important. Notice that we have the field and the display name so we can come in and clean up the display name a little bit by clicking on it and just go ahead and put a space in there between last and name so that's a little nicer. And now what we can do is sort of follow that same process for every field. So let's go back up to title, click on title come to the office property picker and we'll pick title come to first name let's go ahead and put a space in the display name and pick first name as our office field middle name we'll put a space in the display name and we'll pick middle name as our office property. We've already done last name, looks good. Pick on suffix, drop down the office property picker, pick suffix, email address, let's go ahead and put a space in the name there, drop this down, and we'll pick uh, let's see here. Email address 1 is fine. Let's go ahead and pick that. And for phone, we'll pick business telephone number here. Okay, so now we have all of our fields mapped properly to, the, to their respective office property, and we have a nice display name. The next thing that we see is a warning that says no fields have been selected to be shown in the external item picker control. Now we haven't really talked about the external item picker control yet, but basically what you can do with, uh, with your ECTs is you can use your ECTs to drive pickers in lots of different places in SharePoint. And what this warning is telling us is that if we don't select specific fields that are supposed to be shown in the picker, then we're going to end up showing everything and maybe that's what we want maybe that's not what we want but what we can do is come up and pick things that we want usually some kind of unique combination of fields so we can pick last name for example and we can say show and picker and notice the warning goes away and if we want to go ahead and include the first name we can click on that and say show and picker as well okay so now we have basically all of our field mapping done between the client, uh, the rich client rather, and our uh, external system. Let's go ahead and click Next. The next thing that we see here is the filter screen. The filter screen allows us to add various filters to our external content type operations. Notice the warning here says it is strongly recommended to add a type 
filter of uh, a limit type filter for this operation. Basically what happens is a limit filter is going to limit the total number of records that come back from the source. One of the ongoing challenges you'll have with all external content type BCS solutions that you make is trying to control the amount of data that comes back from the external system. After all, if this were a table that contained millions and millions of rows, we wouldn't want to try to show millions and millions of rows in an external list. It just doesn't make sense to show people all that information. And so instead what we want to do is try to create views of the list that make sense. To give you an idea what I mean, perhaps what we would do is create operations that showed um, last names by alphabet. So you could have an, a view of A, a view of B, a view of C, that type of thing. In our case, what we're going to do is keep it simple. And we're going to go ahead and add a filter parameter here for type limit. So we'll click add filter parameter which adds a new parameter for us. And you'll notice that over here on the left, it's referencing the ID field, which is the primary key. So the filter is just, when it's a limit filter, is just going to filter against the primary key field. And then over here on the right, you can see that there's a filter section, but it says you have to click to add. So interestingly, not only do you have to add this filter parameter, but then you have to actually add a filter to it by clicking on this click to add block, which finally brings up the filter configuration where you can select the type of filter that you want. We're going to change the name of our filter to limit filter like that. And then we're going to come down here to the filter type, drop it down, and you can see some of the available filters like comparison, which would only work when something is equal, page numbering, time stamping, and wildcard, where you can use wildcard operators to decide what comes back. For us, though, we're just doing a straight limit, so I'll go ahead and click limit. We're going to do it against the ID field. That'll be just fine. Click OK. And then over here, we need a default value. So by default, what we'll do is we'll limit our result set to have just a hundred things come back. So this is essentially writing a SQL statement that will return the top 100. And so while this may not be the ideal for your particular solution, it's a great way to get started and we're going to guarantee that we bring back a small enough chunk of data that we can show it reasonably in the external list. Now at this point we finished our wizard, our work in the wizard, so we can go ahead and click finish. And now if you take a look, you'll see that here on the uh, design view, we've got the create, read, update, and delete operations that have now been created against our external content type, as well as our connection. So this shows you that the external content type is really a combination of information necessary to connect to the external system and the definitions of CRUD operations that will be performed against that external system. And so with that complete, all we have to do now to finish up is go ahead and click the Save button and our changes now, our ECT, will now be saved into the metadata store in the BDC service application so that we can use it to create external lists and other interesting things inside of SharePoint.